Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Pure Ambition Podcast. If this is your first time here, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you. My mission is to inspire and empower 100 million people to become the happiest, healthiest, most fulfilled version of themselves. And I'm sharing conversations to help you go out and do that yourself and be a part of that mission. So today, my guest is Irik Wiggins. Irik's an absolute legend. He's a content creator and author here in Austin, Texas, who over the past couple of years has amassed an audience of nearly 2 million people across multiple platforms. And every day he's sharing fire low carb recipes on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. He goes live every single weekday, cooking up some incredible food. His two cookbooks have sold thousands and thousands of copies and have helped thousands of people on their weight loss journey. Irik himself is not the person that you're gonna see today. A couple of years ago, he was about 80 to 90 pounds heavier and the keto diet and low carb diet helped him fuel his weight loss journey. And now he's sharing that with the world and helping others live their best lives. Now you don't have to be low carb, keto, or anything like that to get some value out of this conversation. We talk about the simple steps that he took to lose 80 to 90 pounds. We talk about the simple things that he did every day to go from 240 pounds to 160 pounds, how he dropped out of college to become a rapper, was driving Grubhub, and ultimately turned a passion into a full-time career as a content creator. Simple, easy things you can do every day to improve your health and wellness, how to make any food you love in a healthy way that still tastes delicious, and the key ingredients, see what I did there, to living as the best version of yourself. Before we dive into it, if you could take one second to like this video and subscribe to the channel. I would really appreciate it. It helps the channel grow so that we can reach and impact more people. And if you find value in this video, share it with a friend, family member, or somebody who can find value in it. Now, without further ado, let's jump into it with Irik Wiggins. So I was a creator starting in 2017, 18, and I knew growing up in Ohio that that is just not where other creators are. So I had a few places that I was considering and then Austin just seemed like the one. So without even coming here to visit, checking out apartments or anything, I just, I saw one I liked. I signed the lease virtually, flew here and then started living here. Wow. And so what about Austin drew you here? And before we even get to that, so like you started your journey as a creator in Ohio, right? Yep. Okay, you, so you started your journey in Ohio. Did you start really going hard in it while you were still there, or did it take you until you got here to kind of like immerse yourself in everything you're doing? So at the time when I started, it was 2018, and as a creator in the keto diet space, you could post anything and grow a massive following because it was just such a hot topic. So back then... I wasn't really doing much other than just making food, posting a picture of it, uh, like a keto recipe, talking to my audience, talking basically my friends about uh, keto. And just through doing that, I grew a following and started making some money. And then I was like, oh, this is actually a career path for me. So, but at the time I was living with my parents. So, uh, I kind of just pulled the trigger and came to Austin and that's when it was like, okay, this is uh, there's no plan B because I didn't want to go back to Ohio and I had to make it work because I don't want to go sit in an office for eight hours a day. So I was like, all right, I, I got to figure it out. And then I really just started taking content creation seriously. So let's take a step back because I know you have a pretty epic weight loss journey as well and why, you know, you believe so much in the keto diet and the recipes that you create. So let's take a step back further because I know there there was an Irik who's not here with us today who is like 80, 90 pounds heavier, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, growing up, you know, I ate what basically everyone eats, pizza rolls, Pop-Tarts, all that junk. All the good stuff. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's a matter of time before everybody is obese, except, like, 3% of people, just because that's what's available. So, uh, you know, that's what I was eating. I just put on some weight. And then once I got to, like, my senior year of high school, I started going to Dairy Queen twice a day. And I was just, because I grew up in a small town, so that's all we had. I'm mm -hmm. sure if I lived somewhere else, it would have been McDonald's and Taco Bell or whatever. I just, I love fast food. So I started going to Dairy Queen twice a day 
I would get a blizzard and a chicken basket the first time around. The second time around, I would get a blizzard and a chicken wrap and fries or something. So I was going hard and just eating. I don't know what it was, but I was just eating a ton of junk. And uh, I ballooned up to 240. And I stayed there for about a year. And I just believed no matter what I try, nothing is going to work. I had like a very defeated mindset of there's nothing I can do. I'm powerless to this. It's just who I am. And then I heard about keto through the Joe Rogan podcast. He had Mark Sisson on the founder of Primal Kitchen. Yep. And uh, that was in 2016. He just started talking about basically low carb and how if you just cut out, you know, carbs and you don't really worry about anything else, you'll probably lose some weight. So I was like, okay, well, if I don't have to make myself feel hungry all the time, which is what most diets are like, then I'll give this a try. So I did it, and it was rocky at first because it was like filled with cheat days every Sunday and then all of that. But I lost the weight, and two years later, I went from 240 to 160. Wow. 240 to 160 in a year? Two years. Two years, two years, yeah. okay. And what about, like, so when you first started making that change, was it literally just, like, you didn't eat any carbs at all or you slowly start to decrease them or, you know, what did that look like? So at the beginning, it wasn't, like, uh, I didn't know what I was doing. So I was like, oh, I could have chicken nuggets because there's no bread or there's no pasta. It's just chicken nuggets but there's breading on it. So at the beginning, it was more like that, where it's lower carbs still, but it's not cutting out all carbs. And then over time, you just learn, and then I just got more into researching. Like, I just had no idea about anything nutrition-wise. So going down that rabbit hole of, this is fun, it's interesting, I'm losing weight. I just got more and more immersed in reading about it, reading studies, reading books, watching podcasts, all of that. And uh, and eventually it got to the point where, yeah, I'm basically eating like eggs in the morning, uh, a salad for lunch, a steak with like broccoli for dinner. And that was kind of my diet for a while. Hmm. Yeah, so. Interesting. So the thing about keto, paleo, carnivore, vegan, w- whatever else, plant-based – The word diet versus the word lifestyle Mm -hmm. is like interesting to me because I feel like people who say, you know, the keto diet, the carnivore diet, the this, that, the diet, there's kind of like this dogmatic approach versus making it like more of a lifestyle, which to me seems like a little bit more sustainable. Mm -hmm. So what is your take on like keto diet versus a keto lifestyle and I'm new to like learning about like the kind of like keto diet and the keto lifestyle in general. I have heard people say, oh, you know, it's a great tool for certain times of the year or certain periods. Or some people, they even go like, I'm keto for part of the day, most of the mm-hmm. day. And then they have like the majority of their carbs at like one meal. So for me and everybody else listening, kind of explain why you it resonates like like how you're able to do it sustainably and you know kind of keto diet versus like a keto lifestyle so the thing is keto is just like you said a tool and i used it to lose weight and then i've experimented with going off of it and i just find that once potatoes are on the table i'm like well why not go get fries at mcdonald's Because I just have, that's just, I'm just wired to do that. So kind of restricting myself in that way and limiting my options makes it hard to make dumb decisions. So that's why it works for me. And essentially what that means is I set a limit to 30 carbs a day. Don't go over it. And I do acknowledge that a lot of research says fiber is beneficial. So I don't go by total carbs. I go by net carbs. That's a whole different uh, discussion. But uh, but basically, the carbs that raise your blood sugar, I limit those. And I don't limit fiber. So I eat tons of, I eat like a gigantic avocado every day, 
tons of veggies, stuff like that. But I just don't eat anything that's like starchy or sugary. And I find that works for me. But I'm also aware that a lot of people for their hormones, for their workouts, whatever, they're probably better off having potatoes or whatever else carbs are available to them. It's just not for me. And I think that's what the whole lifestyle thing means is you find a diet that aligns with what you're willing to adhere to, and then you make a lifestyle out of it. And I think everyone has something like that that they can adhere to because the statistics of weight loss and diets for the majority of people are just really scary. It's like 95% of people who lose weight gain all of it back and then some. So it's like, uh, I don't want to be part of that. So you kind of have to adhere to some lifestyle for the rest of your life. You can't just be like, all right, I'll just eat whatever feels good because the options are like whatever feels good to eat. It's, it's hard to get to a point where you feel good eating healthy foods. You should feel good eating healthy foods, but like, it's hard to get to get to a point where that sounds good, I guess. It's so you have to adhere to something. Right. I think also people don't have when they don't have direction, when they don't have like a clear goal or a clear why, they just say like I just want to be healthier. Like I just want to lose weight like tying like okay, I want to lose x amount of weight by x date kind of creates a little bit of incentive and then you can start to formulate a plan and then it's like okay, if keto works for you, then you can go and execute that plan, but I think having some sort of goal doesn't always have to be some sort of metric but i think and i would love to get your opinion on this like when people say like i just want to i just want to get healthy like i just want to be healthier what is your response to that and like when people ask you like hey like i really just want to be i want to be healthier like what 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 would you respond to somebody saying that they have to do some sort of restriction mm. so that's what it comes down to i mean there are people who do an animal-based lifestyle, which is like the new trend. You eat meat, fruit, honey, whatever. And they don't really restrict what they eat because they're just eating as much meat as it takes to feel full. And then they have like some mangoes with it and they put honey on, you know, their sweet potatoes and they're just <laughs> eating real food. Yeah, you just so, eat real food. So that is a way to not really restrict, but you are still restricting because you're cutting out processed food. Mm -hmm. So it's like, for someone who wants to get healthy, you have to find whatever form of restriction you're able to stick to for life. Mm. Because you really, whether that means restricting five days a week or restricting indefinitely or whatever type of restriction, I just think that's what healthy is because you cannot just, there are all these intuitive diet coaches who tell people like you can have oreos uh you just have to eat them in moderation and i just think that's so crazy because if you're just going based off what tastes good like you are going to end up overeating because that food is designed to be overeaten that is a really interesting concept and way of looking at things because in quote unquote like diet culture today People on social media, dietitians, like all this stuff promote like restriction is like a demonized word. Mm -hmm. And based off of my health journey, yes, you can have things in moderation, but how many people are actually going to look at the serving size on the ingredient, like on the nutrition label on the back of an Oreo and eat? two or whatever a serving yeah. i don't even know what a serving size of oreos is but you know for most people it's a for me too it's a freaking sleeve mm -hmm. those things are freaking delicious right like they're literally you said it they're engineered in a lab to make people yeah. like addicted to them i saw there was a study where they did on on mice or rats or something where they literally found that like oreos were more addictive than cocaine yeah to the rats right so it's really interesting to hear you talk about restriction in a way that almost like no it's restriction but it's not like it's it's not a bad thing like it, like it's going to help you out like yeah is that is that right is that what you're trying yeah to say? yeah so restriction is just whatever form of restriction feels less um you know feels 
less overwhelming to you. Okay. Because if you tell someone, hey, you have to eat 1,500 calories a day, mm -hmm. and then they're eating Oreos and they're eating Pop-Tarts, they're going to have a few servings of food, and then by dinner, they're just out of calories. Mm -hmm. So that type of restriction would make you miserable. Mm. So maybe you restrict the amount of sugar you're eating, which will limit your options to more volume-based foods like protein, veggies, stuff like that. And now you're restricting in a way where you're not feeling hungry. I think the problem is when you do a diet that results in you feeling hungry but not being able to eat, I think that's the issue. Mm. So you have to find a lifestyle where, yeah, you're restricting something, but you're not going to bed hungry. Mm. Do you, and do you think, you know, kind of the, the diet lifestyle, the content that you create, do you, do you have it geared toward like a certain niche or a certain person? Because I do think context is king in terms of eating and, you know, lifestyle, exercise level, activity levels, things like that. So do you have a certain like niche or kind of person that you target with your content? Yeah, I think growing up eating mostly junk food, fast food, all of that, and then not really resonating with like real foods growing up. I My mom would make pot roast or she would make some real foods that didn't have any processed stuff in it. And I liked that stuff, but it, it just doesn't compare to like we were talking about the stuff that's engineered in a lab. So growing up, I just loved junk food. It was like my favorite thing in the world. And I think the people who are addicted to junk food is my target audience who are trying to change mm. because it's an addiction. And if I can make recipes that resemble what they're used to eating, like today I took a low carb tortilla and I made a recreation of a Crunchwrap Supreme. Mm. And it's like, so people who love Taco Bell but are trying to eat healthier, they can be like, okay, well, you know, I can make this with less vegetable oils, less carbs, less sugar, whatever, and less calories. So I can have this and not, you know, eat three servings of it. It's a college kid's dream right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, that's interesting. I, I love watching your recipes every day. I get excited to see what kind of new creation concoction you're coming up with i love it so with your content too with your recipes and kind of what i've seen with the keto diet with the keto lifestyle a lot of people will put less of an emphasis on like quality of food and more of an emphasis on oh it's fat and protein i can just eat as much of it as i yeah. want and it doesn't work for them right but also there is like the whole flexible dieting thing and if it fits your macros and whatnot, which puts, you know, basically like you can eat whatever you want as long as it's, you're hitting like certain macronutrients, proteins, carbs, fats, mm -hmm. and staying at a caloric deficit or, deficit or whatever else it is. How much of an emphasis do you put on food quality versus just overall quantity? So I think I fall into the category of a mixture of flexible dieting and low carb because you know flexible dieting would mean I could just go eat Oreos and fit it into my macros and everything's all good but I'm not able to do that because a lot of the processed grains and sugars just are too addicting to me so that doesn't work for me so what I do is I cut out the carbs and then I kind of take that approach I would say 30% of the time and then the rest of the time it is just real food so my breakfast is five eggs and my lunch is something fun like what I just talked about the crunch wrap and my dinner is I eat the same dinner basically every night it's just a giant salad with pumpkin seeds avocado chicken maybe I'll put pickles and dill in there and that's uh that's what I'm eating. And then maybe dessert, I have some yogurt and berries and then like a Quest bar. So out of everything I'm eating, it's mostly quality foods, but you know, one, two, maybe three things that I eat out of the 10 things that make up my nutrition intake for the day are a little more fun and relaxed. Mm. Yeah. Is there anything, I mean, I, I know you mentioned refined grains, carbs, sugars, things like that. 
avoid them. First of all, if you if you avoid them, if you do anything, you avoid processed sugar, refined sugar, grain, refined grains, things like that. Overall, like your health is, in my opinion, going to be a lot better. You're gonna yeah. have less information, less inflammation. Uh, you're gonna, your gut health is gonna improve. You're gonna have less brain fog. That for me, is hundred percent has worked for me. Mm-hmm. Is there anything that you try to stay away from besides them when incorporating things in your recipes, like process, like seed oils or anything like that? I do try to stay away from seed oils, although I think that the narrative around seed oils is partially true that they're bad. But I think the main reason why they're bad is I'm trying. I'm gonna put this in a way that doesn't uh, stray too far off the conversation, but. I think what happens is seed oils, just like sugar, were not a part of our diet 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now that they are, they make the food taste way better. So they cause overeating. It's like my salad at night. If uh, If I put avocado in it and just use that instead of dressing to make it creamy or whatever, I don't overeat. And my calories are controlled. Mm -hmm. But ranch dressing, which is made with seed oil or whatever, or soybean oil, canola oil. And sugar. And and sugar. Yeah. (laughs) If I dump ranch dressing in there, it is now a thousand times easier to overconsume calories. Right. Because a tablespoon of ranch dressing is way less filling than the caloric equivalent of avocado. Sure. So it's like... Seed oils just make overeating extremely easy. Mm. And I think that's where you get benefits from avoiding them. Although maybe the research is right and, you know, it gets into your cells and it doesn't leave forever and it is killing us. And there's a there's some like research that supports that. So I'm not denying that. But I just think the main issue is that the added sugars and the added fats to processed foods just cause overeating which cause obesity and that's what is like everyone agrees is killing us Mm. yeah so outside of just the weight loss what are some of the other mental physical even you know spiritual benefits that you've seen from just cutting out a lot of the crap out of your life and you know going from losing 80 pounds and just ultimately becoming like this new version of you i think the main benefit is you feel like you're in control of your life. So before I started keto, I couldn't find a diet that worked. I would try things, I would give up, I would try things, I'd give up. And then when I found something I could stick to, it was like my first win in life where it was like, oh, I'm, I'm, I can do this. I, I can stick to this. And that just changed my whole view of the world, of me, of, of just everything. I was like, oh, I'm the type of person who can take care of myself. And that just changes your relationship to everything in life because you just your self-esteem goes up. You, you view yourself totally differently. And it's not even about the weight loss after a certain point. It's just about, it's like getting in a cold plunge. You know, you, you sit there and you watch, you stare at it, and you're like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> but then you do it and you get done and you feel good about yourself. Yep. So it sticking to something you can that's healthy gives you that same feeling of like I feel good about myself I didn't have the ice cream and I think a lot of people never get to that point they just are stuck in the trying to avoid the ice cream slipping up three days later and eating it giving up trying again three months later they never get to a point where they can get that rush of like "Ah, I said no to the ice cream this feels amazing I think that is one of the main benefits of keto or low carb for me is just like I found something that I can feel good about doing. Mm. And also today's day and age, you can take any recipe and turn it into something that works for you. Right. So ice cream or pizza or cheesy gordita crunches or whatever (laughs) else, like you can turn them into low carb. Right. So what I'm curious, what are, three of your proudest uh, recipes that you've ever came up with? So number one is pork rind crusted chicken fingers. Growing up, 
chicken fingers were my favorite thing in the world. No, no matter how fancy of a restaurant I went to as a kid, I just wanted chicken fingers. So uh, that's my all-time favorite go-to thing to get. And for, like I said, at the beginning of my keto journey, I thought, oh, this is low carb. I can have it. And then you learn you can't. And then you're like, man, I miss these. So I learned that if you bread chicken with pork rinds and you put it in the air fryer, the the fat from the pork rinds kind of soaks into the chicken. And it's almost like you get the breading, but it's like they were deep fried too. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's it's different than breading them with almond flour or something where right. there's no fat around. It's like, it's just so good. That's number one. Number two is something I recently discovered. And it's not as accessible to everyone because you have to have a Ninja Creamy to do it. It's like the new Ninja ice cream maker. And I've seen this. I've seen this. That thing is crazy. Yep. So what I do, I put a protein shake in it. Just, uh, you know, the premier caramel is my go-to with about a tablespoon of heavy cream. And I blend it and the creamy. And sometimes I'll like crumble up a protein bar and put that in there. And it feels like you're eating a blizzard. But you're, it's a 200 calorie meal with the protein bar 300. It, yeah. It's like nothing. So compared to a blizzard that's 1200 calories, that is, uh, it's insane how the protein shake gets so creamy with just one tablespoon of heavy cream. So you just make the protein shake, which is like water and protein shake, or is it like a pre made? The pre made shakes. Okay. It gotcha. might work gotcha. if you shake it up and do it like that. Gotcha. But uh, yeah, so that's number two. And number three is probably a low carb tortilla pizza because oh. it's just, you just buy whatever. You can find clean low carb tortillas. Even if you're looking, if you're not doing keto, you can get the, I think, Siete yeah. makes some good ones. Yeah, I think they make them with like Kosova flour yeah. or something like that. So get a good whatever tortilla fits your lifestyle, put some marinara sauce on it some mozzarella seasonings, pepperoni. You don't even have to put the pepperoni on it, maybe some ham or something. Air fry it or bake it, and it's so good. It's, yeah. Dang, so that's the top three right there? Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's transition a little bit into how you turned this whole thing into a lifestyle, too, because I'm just super impressed on how just ambitious you are with your goals and just, Really like, oh, yeah, I believe I can do this. And then you go make it happen. Right? Mm -hmm. And you don't really let the opinions of others sway you from from what I know and, and what I've heard listening to you on other podcasts. Like, you wanted to be a rapper. Yeah. <laughs> you just went and did that, dropped out of college and uh, to pursue that. And then you were kind of just making things happen, right? Driving Grubhub, doing a bunch of other things, and ultimately led into this. So what was your journey to ultimately turning – content creation into your full-time business so yeah it started as I think growing up I always wanted to to be like uh, a performer of some sort because I remember I, at first I wanted to be a professional wrestler when I was like seven and then that was my dream for two or three years and then I wanted to be a rapper when I was like 17 for a few years. And uh, and that was just because at the time, Drake was like the coolest person ever. And I was like, oh, I could be like that. That would be cool. And, uh, and I just went for it. And I learned a lot on that journey. But it's just a thing where if you're not talented, if you don't... I think if, even if you're not that talented, I could have figured it out. Like, had I known what I know now, maybe I could have figured it out. But... Uh, but I learned so much on that journey that translated to being a content creator, mostly through just showing up every day and making something. So uh, that was like the first time I, I applied discipline to my life other than sticking to keto. So I would make a song every day. I have like a dry erase board of like 600 songs that I made because I just the I just got addicted to crossing off. All right, done. I did it. Even if I sat there and made a beat for like 10 minutes. I crossed it off, I made a song that day. So uh, so that gave me the reps of getting into the habit of creating every day. And then when I got into 
creating content for the keto lifestyle, it was like pretty easy to just make something every day. And uh, at that time, I started off by just re finding a picture of food, posting it, and finding a recipe for a keto version of that, and then writing it in the caption. And it was like so crazy that I grew doing that. Just taking like a picture that already existed. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> never got called for copyright or anything. Well, like what that. happened was someone messaged me like, "Hey, you're using my picture. Uh, you know, I, I make a living doing this." And it and it hit me. I was like, "Damn, this isn't this isn't a good thing to be doing." I, I just never thought of the moral implications of what I was doing. So it hit me. I was, oh, I gotta I gotta take my own pictures. So that kind of turned into me putting a little more effort into the page. And the pictures were so bad at the beginning, but, you know, I just learned. I found the right angles. I got, I never got a camera, but I got good lighting and just used my phone. And, uh, and then my page started taking off even more, which was crazy to me because the pictures were worse. But I think because it was authentically me and it was what I was willing to make, people resonated with it more instead of a big cake that takes two hours to make and all these ingredients it was like here are mozzarella sticks that i wrapped bacon around and people resonated with that more so because it was more doable and uh that's kind of what my page turned into was like things that you can realistically make rather than like oh i'm a chef who takes pictures of my food and loves making food all day it's like i don't really like making food that much i just like eating junk food so how can I fit that into the lifestyle I'm living and share it on social media? So do you now like buying and cooking and creating the whole process or the pro parts of the process that you still have resistance to? I don't. I enjoy when it's done and eating it. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy recording myself making it because if I'm anticipating a recipe will perform well and a lot of people will go make it. That's exciting to me. But yeah, I still don't get excited about cooking and cleaning up and doing all of that. It's just, it's, and I think that's why people like my page because I just don't have the attention span to make a seven layer cheesecake. It's like people want something that's quick and easy to make. Yeah. I mean, what I love about your videos is I know that they're going to be like 15 to 20 seconds, yeah. you know, some of them even less than that. And you're kind of just highlighting the main parts of what you're doing, right? There's, and I've done this myself, like when I'm making a video about food or whatever, every single little detail, I feel like I need to film from every angle and it turns into like this minute and a half long video where I watched the one where you made the Taco Bell, cheesy Gordito, whatever it was. And it was like, I don't know, 12 to 15 seconds. Yeah. And it was like, boom. Tortilla, cut it, cheese, little pico, little little meat, little mm -hmm. stuff on there, and you got a little voiceover, caption, boom, you're good. So I loved how simple that was, and I think that's what, I think that's why I believe your following has been rapidly growing over the years, and why you continue to get so many views and likes and shares, and people are buying your books because it's like simple yeah i think health and wellness nowadays is so freaking confusing with all of the different diets and this and that and there's there's just so many things and i think we need to just simplify things for you it was cut carbs right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was simple enough move your body boom lose weight start to live a better lifestyle right so where did you get the idea to uh, to write a book, right? And then I think you have multiple ones out now, correct? Yep. So, but just to touch on the simplification thing real yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah, please. Sorry, I jumped uh, all over the nah, place No, nah, no, yeah, you're good. So that is something I learned recently. In around 2020, 2021, I was making, I, I really started making a video a day in 2020. And uh, that's like right when TikTok became pretty big. I was like, all right, I'll make a video a day. And then 2021, I that was just routine to make a video a day. And then the past year or so, I realized 
because the algorithm is constantly changing. So people's attention spans are shorter. There's more people sharing stuff. It's just, it's harder to keep people's attention on your content. 100%. So whenever something bombs and doesn't perform well, I always come out on the other side with, because you feel it. So uh, I'll get to the book in a minute, but I think this is really important for all content creators to know. It is so important when you have a post that doesn't do well to really marinate in those feelings and just let it crush you. Because it's, you know, for me, if something bombs, it isn't just, oh, my self-esteem hurts because people didn't like my video. It's like, oh no, is everything crumbling around me? Like, am I going to be able to feed my family off of this anymore? Mm. So that feeling of posting something and it not doing well Every time that happens to me, maybe it's every couple months, my content just goes through a whole different evolution and it becomes 10 times better. So, you know, my most recent one is I started adjusting the lighting differently and getting, but then a few months ago, it, it was like you said, to the point where I don't include all the steps. And that was a huge one where my engagement there was a huge algorithm crash where everyone's engagement was just trash for a while. And, and I was like, man, this sucks. What can I do to, because someone is getting views. So if your, if your algorithm crashes, it doesn't mean that people aren't using the app anymore. It just means the competition just got harder. Mm. So you have to do better. And it's like a Mr. Beast mentality where stop saying the algorithm, start saying the quality of my content. Oh, that's so good. And, and your life will become way better because now you're in control. Mm. But if it's the algorithm, you have no control. So, you know, just you can just live in that feeling of helplessness. Mm. But if it's the quality of your content, you're in total control. And, and it's going to be harder. It's going to require more creativity. But you can figure out how to make it better. Mm. So one of the most recent ones I did was I would show myself like, putting butter in the pan and then laying the parchment paper on the baking sheet and all of that. And I was like, what if I just show people what they need to see and take out all the stuff that they already know to do? So I did that. And then my videos went from 30 seconds to like 12 seconds. And that helped me survive the last algorithm crash where all my videos got like half the views they were getting. And then I figured out how to shorten them, make them more to the point, simplify and then the views went back up. So social media is a constant game of just figuring out, all right, why isn't this working anymore when it did work a year ago and how can I get better? And that is just so important for all creators to know that you are in control. You, you can make a better video and the algorithm isn't this powerful thing. It's just the quality of your videos. So I just really wanted to hammer that point in. No, I think that's so good. And I, I apologize for jumping all around. I tend to sometimes I'll ask like three questions in one right there. But I think that's so true, right? And for you, it, it was just finding ways to improve every day. Taking, Going back to when you were a rapper, it was, can I write one song a day? Yeah. Right. And for people on a, on a weight loss journey or a diet journey or they're pursuing some sort of physical goal, you're not going to see that goal today. You're not going to see that goal tomorrow. But if you just, like you said, just check it off. You check that box every single day. Ultimately, you are going to be the one in control. And, and ultimately, you get to like a month, two months, three months later. Oh, wow. The scale is dropping down. Yeah. Oh, now I can see a little bit more muscular definition there, right? Um, but kind of jumping over to the content side of things too. With, and I've struggled with this too views don't always equate to like a lot of times i'm like hey, I, I know for a fact that like i put time effort into this video and like i know it was quality and sometimes it just doesn't hit the way you think it's going to right ultimately yes we want to continue to grow our followers cast a wide net help more people like that's why we do what we do mm -hmm. for you how do you balance that like not getting so caught up in the algorithm, in the views and the likes and the comments and the shares and all those things, but still focus on like, hey, is it is it the, just me and the quality of my video or are there changes I need to make? Or how do you kind of balance like the 
dopamine rises and falls that come with being a content creator? So I never check. I, I started doing this recently because there it there was a, a re, ever since threads came out, it could be unrelated, I don't know, but it, it did get to a point where my views like dropped off a few weeks ago. And uh and it's more TikToky where one gets a ton and then the next one doesn't get a lot. Mm -hmm. And for a while I was just consistent, like the same. So that was hard for me. So what I do is I, I just don't look at it. I just, you know, if I'm replying to comments, I don't look at the amount of likes. I like I'll literally cover my phone because I just I don't wanna I just wanna focus on making the next video better because if that's what I do, then I'll continue to grow. Sure. So it's not about how today's video is performing, it's about how can tomorrow's video be better. Mm. And then you're kind of immune to it. It's like you you just have to even if it's not true you just have to believe there's something about this video that could have been better and i think that gets you off the dopamine roller coaster of oh how, what did people think of my video it's like you know maybe i should have showed what seasonings i used Th there's always something that could have been better even if you think it was perfect and it just didn't hit you can just go watch it again and be like oh maybe i should have showed more of this or less of this like i just think taking the mindset of there's always something to be improved and but it's easy for me to say with a million followers because if you're starting out you know i just i do believe though if you make really good videos you'll grow yeah so i just think that's the only thing you should focus on and everything else kind of just distracts you because if i post a video today that bombs and i'm checking the likes and then I'm feeling really crappy. You know, it's good to let yourself feel that and improve from it. But before I do that, I'll check it tonight. Before I do that, let me just focus on making the best video possible today. Mm. Yeah. What principles or things that you, that do you follow that, you know, for example, like when you were on your weight loss journey, a lot of it is just showing up every day and doing the thing that you committed to doing. Mm -hmm. How is that applied from like fitness, wellness, nutrition into now what you do with content creation and as an entrepreneur? I think it's it's very tied together. There's a quote where it's how you do anything is how you do everything. So if you're uh, doing the dishes, you don't want to do them halfway because that's just who you are. And I think that's kind of how I feel about things where almost having... So I start my day with, I did this the other day, and it's really cool to do this if you're not feeling as motivated. You write down everything you have to do, including the dumb stuff, like start the Roomba or, uh, or unload the dishwasher, along with make the video, uh, send the proposal to the client, send the email. And when you have all of that down, you start off doing the, all right, I'll start the Roomba, and then you, you check it off. And you get that feeling of, oh, I'm checking stuff off. I'm, I'm doing a good job today. And I think that's what it comes down to is like just getting stuff done and then also feeling good about the little stuff you get done too. And that applies to health where I was really addicted to getting my steps to 15,000 every day. And uh, because I have two dogs, which I walk, I take, I have a 10 month old baby who I, go on walks with and I put her on my chest I walk around and it's easy to get a lot of steps in and but even before that I've just always been addicted to my step count mm. and I think it's about you know finding the habits that you enjoy doing that you're going to feel good about checking off and almost maybe I'm different because I have a very addictive personality but it's like find the exercise find the the career goals, find the the health goals that you can get addicted to. Mm. And then you really can't lose because it's like, it's an addiction. Okay. So, so it's 15,000 steps. Is that one of your, what are your, you, you have that whole list right there, mm -hmm. right? Are there maybe like three to five things that you have to do every single day in order for you to make progress? I ask that for, for myself, I like to do the same thing as you. I like to just get everything out of my head and onto paper mm -hmm. so that it's there and then kind of restructure and reprioritize what I think are the, what I call needle movers. Mm -hmm. So like the three to five needle movers that are going to 
ultimately help my business, my relationships, my f- wellness, my fitness, the things that I'm pursuing in life, and then the start the Roomba, sweep the floor, yeah. clean the bathroom, those things like that. Like they'll get done, but it's after these needle movers get done first. So what are those three to five needle movers that you have to do every single day? So number one is spend an hour. My daughter's name is Sophia. Spend an hour with her. That's I don't do it first, but I, but that's like the priority where when we first ha- because my fiance Anna is uh, that's she's a full time mom. So she's with Sophia all day. And since I'm working from home, I'm with the baby all day, too. I'm like making a video and then I'll go over and give her some kisses and then walk back over and continue the video. So when I was doing that for a while, I never sat off a chunk of time to really bond with her, though. So it was, uh, I'll be working, I'll go say hi to the baby, I'll go back to working, and then we'll put the baby to bed, and that's the day. And and my fiancé had a conversation with me where she was like, hey, you're not spending time with your daughter. And, uh, and I was like, oh, crap. You know, I felt like I was, but based off my actions... And what she saw, I wasn't. So it it gave me this opportunity to pri- to add that to the priority list where for an hour a day we play, I take her on the walk. And after I started doing that, I felt so much more connected to her. And it was like, oh, I was missing out on so much of her person. Because when you're a baby, your personality is changing every day. I was missing all these little things that I didn't notice just by interacting with her in passing. So... That is number one. I'll always spend an hour with her every day, no matter what's going on. It's like, let's get that hour of playing. We'll open up the play mat. We'll play for an hour. That's number one. And number two, some sort of video. I'm going to get it done. And if I don't get a video done, I'm going to find an old video and like re-stitch it and touch it up to recycle because sometimes you can recycle content. But overall, it's like get a video done. That's number two. Number three, I would lump steps and like movement exercise in with morning sunlight. I think that I'm, I don't know, maybe morning sunlight is its own category, but uh, I would just say like physical health, uh, getting out and moving outside. That That's just crucial to me. And if I don't get my morning sunlight, it, it's almost like uh, I'm scared my sleep is going to suck. So I'm, I have to go outside. I just, I run straight to the door when I wake up and it's like, all right, I'm outside. So that is uh, very important to me. And after that, if I'm tracking my, some days I don't track my macros, some days I do. On the days where I'm tracking, it's to get 200 grams of protein. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, I think that's so important to make sure you don't overeat and to just just protein is beneficial, especially as you get older, mm-hmm. you don't want to like fall and break your hip. So protein, huge. And then, yeah, that's it. So quality time, physical health, work. Yeah. And then, yeah. I like that. I like that. You're checking multiple, multiple boxes in multiple areas of your life. It's not all health. It's not all business. It's not all relationships you know what i'm saying you're checking multiple boxes there i love that so i'm curious with your content with your creativity of trying to you know you create one recipe every single day you know i'm sure there are times where you're feeling way more inspired you're like oh i can create this recipe i create this recipe create this recipe do you have a way of kind of structuring and organizing what you're going to film on a week by week basis or is it literally like every day hey i'm gonna wait till something comes to me then i'm gonna go to the store and then i'm gonna buy what i need and then come home and cook it or do you have a way of like planning ahead batching any content how is your process of how basically what does your creative flow look like so i'm a very routine person for everything except creativity okay (laughs) and uh how that works is i wake up I go on my morning walk, I walk the dogs, I, and then I sit down and I just go on to Reels or TikTok and I just look at recipes and I just find some inspiration for what looks good. And then I'll, maybe I'll see someone 
wrapped bacon around pickles and I'll be like, how could I do something similar to this? Because that looks good to me. How can I do something similar to this, but different? And then I'll be like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Or I'll wake up and I'll see someone making like a chicken and rice taco skillet. And I'll be like, oh, how could I make a keto version of that? So I start my day by getting outside and then I go on my phone and I just look for inspiration. Mm. And then I'll Instacart. Shout out to Instacart. That makes my life a thousand times easier. I'll Instacart whatever I'm going to use in my, because I make two recipes a day on weekdays. Okay. Um, I'll do a reel and then I go live and I cook. Oh, nice. And, every, uh, every single day. Yeah. Well, on weekdays. On weekdays. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so I go live, I do the reel. So I'll Instacart the two ideas I have mm. for that day. And, uh, and while I'm waiting on the Instacart, that's when I'll get my workout in. And, and then I'll just start making recipes. And then by the end of the day, I finish my live. And then it's just family time. Gotcha. Okay. So you don't have any, some, any sort of creative flow. It's more so just a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I think that is the flow okay. of, uh, of finding inspiration and being like, oh, this looks good. And then from, say, one or two to seven, yeah, I'll make that real. I'll do the voiceover and then go live. Okay. Yeah. When it comes to your diet, are you more routine and more structured and like planning what you're going to eat throughout the day, throughout the week? Or is it kind of just go with the flow? I don't know what you're saying. Being you're a creator makes this hard because the... The routine thing is is so easy for me. Okay. Just eating the same thing every day is just so easy for me. Mm -hmm. But making the food recipes kind of backs me into a corner where I'll, I'll have what I'm normally going to eat, but then I make this crunch wrap, and it's like, how can I not eat the whole thing? I was going to say. So, so now <laughs> I eat the whole thing, and now it's like, crap, I got to have less yogurt at dessert tonight because my calories are tipping sure so that's where track i think tracking your calories isn't necessary for 90 percent of people if they just find a good lifestyle mm -hmm. but for me since i'm making all this crazy food every day it's like i kind of have to keep a limit otherwise it's just because the average person doesn't make a crunch wrap and then for live make pork rind crusted chicken fingers and then like a low carb tortilla pizza the average person just isn't surrounded by all that food every day mm. so it's like i think most people could just stick to low carb and not count their calories and just focus on protein but for me yeah it just that kind of screws me mm. yeah i think just like keto being a tool i think tracking macros can also be a tool right? i don't think for me personally it's something that I come back to in times of like when I'm really focusing on a goal mm -hmm. in terms of health and wellness. Like right now, I'm actually back to tracking macros for the first time in a very long time because I'm getting back into a marathon prep in a month mm -hmm. and I want to get down, I want to lean out, drop, lose a couple of pounds. And mostly it's really just like hitting a protein goal. Yeah. And that alone, I always tell people like if you track anything, just, just track your protein. Yeah. And then you just backfill your backfill your calories with carbs or fats or it does it doesn't really matter but I, I i lean more on the try to get as many healthy fats in as yeah. you can versus the carbs and if you do get them from like fruit or honey or raw dairy or i mean that's me I, i'm an i'm an animal based guy so mm -hmm. I, I do like that kind of stuff but um what are your thoughts on like tracking max tracking macros versus intuitive eating so i think all diets are great tools i think tracking macros is the one that just is just brutal, but it gives you exactly what you want. So it's like uh, what gets measured gets managed. It, it's it's impossible to eat fourteen hundred calories a day and not lose weight. And yeah. anyone who says otherwise is just out of their mind. Yeah, it's like maybe you're a ninety pound, five foot two woman. So yeah, maybe your <laughs> caloric maintenance is a little lower than that. Sure, but for the average person who's overweight, who's overweight, there's absolutely no way that if you are really tracking your calories, that you're not going to lose weight. Mm -hmm. So it gives you complete control over your weight loss journey. Sure. But the adherence is like, it's so much harder than just 
cutting out a macro or cutting out processed food and just kind of intuitively eating. Sure. It's just so much more challenging to stick to. Mm -hmm. So it's the best tool, but it's the hardest to stick to in my mind. Mm -hmm. Maybe other people feel differently. Maybe it's easier to stick to it for them. But I, I think most people just are not willing to track everything they eat. Mm. So finding these other tools that resonate with them could be a better approach. Mm. So for somebody listening who is trying to get started on their weight loss journey, maybe they've tried, maybe it's, they just haven't had a lot of success. They've tried various diets. They've tried this. They've tried, you know, Atkins and intermittent fasting and carnivore, plant-based, keto, whatever else it is. If you were going to give this person three things that they could do every single day to take control of their health, and make progress in the long term, thinking long term here, what would be your three pieces of advice? Get 30 to 50 grams of protein at every meal. Mm. That's just, I think having the mindset of adding rather than subtracting is more, uh, it makes you feel better about restricting. It's like, if I'm feeling good about, it's like adding protein to every meal kind of makes you feel like, a win without, oh, I'm still hungry though. And why do you think adding protein is so important to every meal? There's just, it just, the way it's more satiating and it's the way it signals to your hormones that you're full, it's just different than eating a, a Pop-Tart. Like eating a plate of chicken versus eating a plate of Pop-Tarts, one of them is going to have you feeling very satiated, one of them is going to have you feeling starving two hours later. So it's just, it just comes down to how satiated you feel. So prioritizing protein is huge. And, and like I said, it gives you a different relationship to food than what most people on diets are used to, which is I can't have, I can't have, I'm restricting, I'm still hungry. It's like, oh, I have to add this. Oh, I don't even feel that hungry, but I got to hit that 30 grams of protein. So I'll just add some extra chicken to my meal. Mm. And I think that changes your relationship to food in a positive way. 100%. So I would say that. Um, number two, find meaning, purpose, like friendships in your life. Because if you're just bored all the time, you're just going to eat all the time. Mm. It, most people who are overweight, a lot of their eating is not due to hunger. It's, it's due to just boredom or it brings them joy. It's like they're... They look forward to it every night. It's the highlight of their day. So, you know, find something else that can be the highlight of your day. It's like, what do you tell an alcoholic? They, they have to find something better than alcohol or they're not going to get off of it because mm -hmm. why would they if, if that's the best thing? So it's like when you're in that food addiction cycle, that is the best part of your day. So you have to find something else to be the best part of your day. Okay, well, that's two. Yeah. We'll be number we'll be number three. Uh I would say the protein, find something find that, meaning. that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. And uh some sort of movement. I guess just starting small. I guess the protein and the movement could could be lumped into one. And then it's like just start with the smallest step possible that you can stick to every day because that's going to make you feel good. It all comes down to just feeling good about your journey because that's how you're going to stick to it. Nobody sticks to something that makes them miserable. So if that means going out for a 10 minute walk and then saying, I exercise today, that's a win. So it's finding small wins and we'll just put, we'll lump that into movement. Right. So find some sort of movement that you enjoy doing that you can do every day and do it. That's yeah. freaking beautiful, man. I love that. I love, and I love how all three of those things can kind of be lumped together, right? Yeah. Like find, you can find meaning and purpose in like the exercise that you do, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you tell yourself like, I'm doing this and it is doing something good for my body, for my mind, for my soul. And then you nourish yourself with like a high protein meal. Like it's this kind of circular yeah. fact of just ultimately uplifting yourself. So I think that's super powerful. I'm curious with all of the things going on in your life, you got a lot of really cool things up, up your sleeve and you're always coming out with, with new great stuff. What is one thing that really excites you 
heading into the rest of 2023? Mm, probably working on my new book. I This is book number three, right? Yeah, yeah. So I released one in 2020. I never got to your question about that. But basically, everyone was asking, do you have a book? And I didn't. So I just threw all my recipes into a book. I didn't even know how to use like book editing apps, but I knew how to use Photoshop. So I made the book in Photoshop, which is like crazy. And uh, and I put it out on Amazon. It's very easy to submit your manuscript to Amazon. And and then I got an editor for the second iteration of that, which was like a revised version. And that's really my first book was the revised version of the one that I put out in 2019, 2020. And then my next one was Carefree Keto. I just put that one out in February. And I didn't even have plans to put out a book anytime soon. But having my daughter kind of put like a fire under me Mm -hmm. where I'm just making way more videos than I've ever made before. And I'm just more motivated to make more recipes. So I looked back and ever since that book came out, I've made almost 100 new recipes in those four months that it's been out, five months. So uh, I'm like, I think it's time to put this into a new book. So that's amazing. Just the, you can continue to just show up every day, create one new recipe a day, create one new video a day. Boom. There's another book. And theoretically you could say like, Hey, if I create one a day and I won't have X amount of recipes in this book, you can write, you know, a book of every couple of months. Yeah. Right. And there are so many creators who just create when they feel like it. And it's usually because they have some backup plan or some um, other source of like income. But I think because it's the only way I feed my family is by being a creator, I just don't have that luxury of being like, I don't feel creative today. Sure. It's like, no, I have to make something today or my daughter is going to starve. Yeah. So uh, it's like that's where I'm thankful of having set that habit of do something every day Mm. because now I can just amplify it and like take it to a whole new level. I love it, dude. This has been amazing. Thank you for bringing so much knowledge, so much insight and just realness because I feel like everything that you shared was so applicable to the everyday person. So thank you for that. The last question I have for you is this is the pure ambition podcast. So ask all my guests this, when you hear those words together, pure ambition, What does that mean to you and how does it apply to your daily life? I think pure ambition just means you go get what you want. It's like, I want this, so I'm going to figure out how to get it. And it's like there's a lot of people who think that goals and dreams are possible for others, but not for them. And it's like, no, you can do it. You just you just have to figure it out. You you can do it. So uh, I would say pure ambition just means you can do it. If, if you don't do it, it means you didn't want to do it. So it's like if you don't succeed, it's not because all this was working against you. It's just because you didn't want to succeed. Mm. Otherwise, you would have succeeded. So it's like you can do it. Go do it. Beautiful, bro. Yeah. Dude, thank you for this. We'll have to do it again soon. But I appreciate you. I appreciate all the value that you give each and every day people want to check out more of your stuff where can they find you i am on social media at keto snacks with a z and on tiktok it's iric snacks so i-r-i-c-k snacks love it thanks brother thank you for having me this was fun Thank you guys so much for tuning into today's episode. I wanted to give you all a heads up too that I launched a free community on the Upspace app where you can join, ask me questions, connect with like-minded individuals, follow my four-week running and strength training program that has some dedicated mobility sessions in there as well so that we can all optimize our health and fitness together. So if you're interested, head over to the App Store, download the Upspace app, and join the Pure Ambition community today. Love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.